Whereas, Come on. Oh. You're good, Chris. Are we good? Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Boyle. I'm one of the members of the Geology Division of the Asphalt Nation Club. Each summer, when you have these open houses, one or more of us from the Geology Group is trying to. Uh, presentation so we have a nice rally with the program in the summer. So today I'm going to talk about the Mill River, which you can see out the window here, it's only a few hundred feet away. And then you'll learn a few things as I am when I put the program together that you didn't know before. Uh, where did David go? Yeah. Oh, maybe, uh, I think you got to stand on this side, Chris, so, so we can have the microphone hear you better. All right. Yes. Yeah, it'll, it'll, I think it, it'll, that'll work better too. Come around this side here, whatever. Yeah. And then the camera will also pick you up too. Yeah. Okay. Still so, isn't. Here's the dog right here. So, yeah. Keep it going right now. It's not. Oh, sure. This thing worked for almost an hour. This is going to be a long program if we're still on the first slide. Wow. All right. Um, okay, try that, Chris. Okay. We'll try to go with the second slide here. Yeah, and it's still not going any of that. Of course. But that maybe put the video mouse again. Huh? Maybe put the mouse to just select the the uh slide to see how that works. Uh, no try it. Wow, that didn't work out. Will the arrow work? It should. No, we'll just use the arrow. Let me go back. I think you're going to have to follow it out. Yeah. There's your pointer anyway. The pointer seems to work. All right. Well, anyway, we'll get the start here. Um, going to talk a little bit about the geomorphology, a little bit about geology, history, human history, the industrial development along the Millers River. And hopefully you'll see some interesting images here. And we'll get started. How the Millers River formed. It was formed in the tertiary period, 50 to 60 million years ago. That'd be around this era here on our geological time scale. And it assumed its present state over 1 million years ago. The river was originally much wider than it is today and has slightly altered its course over the years. And we'll see a little bit of that as we get along here. 25,000 years ago, all of New England was covered with the latest of several massive glaciers, more than a mile thick in some areas. And you can see the, uh, the blue here is the advance of the glacier and it came all the way down to Long Island Sound here. So all of Massachusetts was covered under this glacier. And as each glacier came along, it largely erased the signs of any previous glaciers. As the glacier melted more than 10,000 years ago, large amounts of water were released, which formed numerous glacial lakes. As the impoundments of the glacial lakes eroded, rivers formed, which drained water toward the Connecticut River. Our topography was sculpted and drainage patterns shifted by the scarring action and deposits of the glacier. The superficial geology of our area is larger result of this glacial activity. As anyone knows who's tried to dig around the area, glacial till covers nice and schist bedrock through most of the region. Athol sits on a great sand plain, which is a re remnant of one of these glacial lakes. Abundant and easily mined sand and gravel in the area resulted from these glacial deposits. 
ramp and pluck photography abounds in our region. The glacier advanced like here and then a way forward, dug down, dug out rock and debris and moved it farther along its course. Kettles are ponds or depressions left behind by the melting glacier. Blocks of ice broken off from the glacier often were buried or surrounded by meltwater sediments. When the ice eventually melted, the overlying sediments had no support, collapsing to form a depression that oftentimes filled with water to become a lake. And this uh, nice diagram from the National Science Foundation shows quite well the block of glacial ice sitting on glacial till or outwash and more piling of sediments. Eventually it melted and this uh, glacial lake formed. There are many glacial lakes along the Millers River and its tributaries, uh, glacial kettles along the Millers River as tributaries. Some have water in them, others have dry bottoms. Silver Lake, not far from here, is a glacial fill kettle. Another is uh, Depot Pond over in Baldeville, which is popular with fishermen. Uh, Depot Pond was a source of water for steam locomotives years ago on the railroad. These two 50,000 gallon water tanks were fed with water from Depot Pond. But some glaciers are dry depressions. So if you look at this in the USGS topographic map, you can see these little uh, ellipses, circles. They have these hatch marks. Those are depressions in the ground and are indicative of uh, glacial kettles a lot of times. There's one here that's uh, sort of a swampy land, so there's some degree of water in that, but it's not really a pond. This is over toward Winchenden. Many swamps in the area uh, which drain to the Millers River are remnants of glacial lakes. This is Thousand Acre Swamp on the border of uh, Athol and Phillipston, part of the old Athol Bird Nature Club sanctuary which existed in the late 1960s, early 70s, I think, Dave. Um, here, my father's leading an eighth grade science trip across the log in the middle of a thousand acre swamp. I don't think anybody fell in. I didn't, at least I didn't hear about it. They did. <laughs> um, here, are some of the students are exploring Thousand Acre Brook, which drains Thousand Acre Swamp to the Mills River. This picture I've been taken from the bridge on um, the corner of Willis Road and South Royalston Road. The bridge is now gone. And this is a road across some, uh, so across some market basket. Interesting area, a lot of black flies in the spring. So where does the Millers River run? This is a beautiful map of the Millers River watershed, courtesy of the Millers River Watershed Council, thank you, Arden. Uh, who drew it, but it's nice. It shows the begins up here in Ashburn here. We'll get to that a little more in a minute. Comes down through Royalston, Athol over through Orange, Irving, down to where it joins the Connecticut River. And the 52.1 mile Mills River has eroded a deep valley into the Bronson Hill Belt because of the much lower elevation on the west where it ends at the downfall to Deerfield Basin. The river meanders through a series of cascades from about 600 feet elevation near Athol to about 200 feet at its uh, mouth with the confluence with the Connecticut River. Um, the maps indicate the source of the Mills River where it's first called Mills River is at the confluence of the Bear Meadow Brook and Bluefield Brook in Ashburnham, where the elevation is 1,124 feet. And an aerial view shows it looking like this. This would be the start of what they call Miller's River. Um, I wasn't able to get into that area, but I did take a photo from right here on the bridge looking north, which is as close to the source of the Miller's River as I was able to get. Uh, there's a north branch of the Miller's River also, and that source is uh, a mountain pond near in New Ipswich, uh, New Hampshire. Uh -huh. Have you been there? No, I've not been up there. Have you? Well, I'm trying to figure out where it is. It comes down through Lake Menominee to Winchenden. Okay. And then it meets the Ashburnham branch mm -hmm. at Whitney Pond. And then it flows out of Whitney Pond is the main main stem. Yeah, I'm not sure. There is a road here, but I'm not sure. I haven't been up there, but I'd like to check that out. 
area. That was it could be. Could be. I'll check that out. Let you know. So as Ivan said, uh, the North Branch comes down here to Whitney Pond, and that joins the main branch of the Millers River from Ashburnham. Whitney Pond, and then uh, proceeds west through the village of Waterville, as this old postcard shows. The view upstream on the Mills River from the New Boston Road, which is in the uh, conservation recreation land near Birch Hill. There are some other tributaries up in the area. In fact, the Mills River, like most rivers, does have a lot of tributaries. This is Priest Brook, and is viewed from Goodnow Road in the village, which was New Boston, which was largely evacuate when Birch Hill Dam was constructed in the early 1940s. Water flows along River Road on its way to South Royalston, very peaceful up there, except when it's in flood stage. And this old postcard shows it winding into the, uh, the village of South Royalston, little dam there. This is a picture would be taken what is today the Route 68 bridge over the river. The river flows gently through the village of South Royalston. Uh, this is the now disused bridge on King Street. It's a different bridge today, but it's still out of use. And there are remains of the dam here. It's old postcard. The settlement of South Royalston grew on the banks of the Millers River. Hints of past use are seen at South Royalston. You can see that dam that showed in the earlier postcard is there's still remnants of it here today. This is Route 68 in the background here. This picture is taken from the King Street Bridge. Until the flood of 1936, Bearsden Road across from the Athol Hospital connected with Gulf Road, which connects uh, South Royalston and Chestnut Hill Avenue. And there was a bridge here called the Lewis Bridge and it went about across like this, and I've never found a photo of it, and I don't know if it was a covered bridge or what kind of bridge it was, but it's been gone since 1936. Paul Kaczynski, the late leader of our geology group, reported that the nearby sheep rock in this area is an amphibolite rock, 280 million years old, and it's formed of volcanic ash and lava containing green chloride. This is uh, a Pequod curve. When I have a map up, I'll point it out to you. Okay, right here is Sheep Rock. It's uh, just west of where Bearsden Road terminates. I, before they gated it off, my first vehicle was a four-wheel drive international scout, and I made it all the way up there once with red stone. We are looking for ox. And that bridge it's uh, washed out 36 flood to be right here. Resendez Pool is uh, right up there. Paul Resendez lives there. The Mills River cascades over steep terrain west of South Royalston and drops to an elevation of 650 feet in Athol. Potholes similar to this one uh, are found in Littleton Formation Rock and ledges along the Mills River south of the Merrifield Farm on Chestnut Hill. Um, I don't have any photos of it. This one was taken out at Shelburne Falls the day you were out there, Keith, back in the 1971 or so. But it looks similar to this. Potholes are caused by circulating water, which holds a small rock or pebble up against a larger rock and keeps churning away over a period of time and forms this pothole. They're usually fairly smooth on the outside. On the topographic map here where this green X is, that's the proximate location of three potholes, which Paul Kaczynski located in 1977. And in his book, he mentions that his father had found even more potholes in the area back in the 1920s. Paul stated that the most interesting was about, the most interesting pothole that is, was about eight to 10 inches in diameter and 20 to 24 inches deep carved into the Littleton Formation bedrock. This is a covered bridge on Chestnut Hill Avenue, which used to go across the Mills River at UTD. 
Um, my neighbor who went to high school around 1920 she said she remembered walking over that on the way to high school. So I think it was removed and replaced sometime in the 20s. I don't think it went out in one of the floods. In the back here is the dam at the Athol Manufacturing Company. Behind Starrett's Dam, the water backs up and grows fairly silent. This is a view upstream in Athol from a book that was reprinted in 1999, Athol Illustrated, beautiful old photo. This is the bridge at Starrett's, a much earlier bridge than it's there today on Crescent Street. And there was a dam there at that time. And, and looking in the other direction, we look to the west down at this bridge on Crescent Street and the river, river winds its way down toward Exchange Street and up on the hill here, this is Sentinel Elm. Probably some of you have heard of that. It was a real landmark in the area until a storm took it down, I think in 1932 or somewhere thereabouts. Here's an 1892 view showing Exchange Street looking north. Uh, this will be taken from somewhere over near Ridge Ave, I believe. At that time, there were two branches of the Millers River. We'll get into that more a little later, but these very crude early bridges cross over. The uh, Legion home will be over here, and this will be the Exchange Street Hill up to Wallingford Ave, and Pequog Ave goes along here. That's the bridge right out here, where Main Street turns into South Main Street. Um, I think that was replaced maybe in the early teens. Kent, do you know if that's right? By the one that was since replaced maybe about 15 years or so ago. I believe that's be looking south. Over in Miller's, over in Orange, the river slows down behind the dam there. Buildings have changed, but the water is still fairly similar. West of Orange, we have this rather bucolic looking scene. Uh, Route 2A is over here, and the railroad crosses the river here. It's an old postcard view. The dam on its way, on the river's way to Irving. Uh, Paul Kaczynski mentioned in the Irving area, garnet containing mica schist is found, and the garnets are of gem quality. These were once mined for jewelry in a small mine, but sadly, location of the mine is lost. Well, we should go find it. I agree. It'll be fun. Yeah. There was another mine a little later after that, and Paul didn't think they were the same mines, but I don't know where either one was. Here's the view along uh, Route 2 my father took in the mid-1960s, Farley Ledges, Rattlesnake Mountain, which rises high above the Millers River Valley. The rock in the Farley area is Monson Nice, 320 million years old, as well as granite and quartz veins at 300 million years old. The smoky quartz veins were under high pressure when formed and are of gem quality with the mineral pyrite mixed in. I wonder if we have any in the collection. Do you know, Joni or Max? Yeah. yeah. This occurs both on Rattlesnake Mountain to the north of the river and on Bear Mountain, which is on the south of the middle of this river at Farley. My father had this view from up on top of the Farley ledges. In the early 1960s, you can really see how high up you are looking down on the Millers River. Arcos type sedimentary rock is found in the area where the high power lines cross Route 2 and also the Millers River. In the spring, if you look across the river in June, you often see the uh, laurel and bloom along the power lines there. At Millers Falls, is a, here's the natural oxbow here where well, the river makes a very abrupt turn here. I tried to get in there to look at it and get some pictures, but it was not readily accessible. The Millers River ends at the Connecticut River, just beneath the uh, French King Bridge. I took this photo back a couple months ago during the flooding in upstate Vermont, and you can see the water of the Connecticut River flowing south, it's all full of sediment that's been washed out in the floods. And the less uh, flooded Mills River is much clearer, and you can see where they join out here. This particular bridge has been closed for a number of years, but it's East Mineral Road, which connected the two sides of the Mills River. 
The Connecticut Valley Border Fault is a west dipping normal fault along the eastern margin of the Deerfield Basin. The late Triassic and early Jurassic rocks of the basin cover a large fault block that dropped thousands of feet down relative to the Bronson Hill block to the east of the fault. Hence, Miller's River goes down elevation quite a bit to get to that 200 feet foot sea level beneath the uh, French King Bridge. The east end of the French King Bridge rests on a narrow belt of Paleozoic rocks, but the west end sits on Jurassic rocks. Uh, the Paleozoic will be here, These this era of rocks on the east side and the west side are Jurassic, or Triassic right in this area, quite a few million years difference in the rocks. So human history, fish, particularly salmon, and trout attracted Native Americans to the Millers River Valley. Corn was planted on the river banks. Native American rock mounds survive to this day alongside the Millers River into the woods. Uh, and this indicates human activity in the era, area here prior to the European settlement. Paul Kaczynski constructed a number of models of Native American rock mounds, which he had found photographed and then built mounds to resemble them. This is a model of a ceremonial mound, while this one is a model of a directional mound. I'm not quite sure where the individual ones are that he found, but I think they probably are in the Winchendaren area. Early Native American tribes in New England were about on the northern reaches of the Nipmuc tribe in this area here. Uh, the Native Americans named the river Capacontaquash, if anyone wants to hazard a better pronunciation, feel free. It's a Nipmuc word meaning split banks river. This is uh, from Indian Deeds. A modern name appears to be Miller's River. This ancient map in the library of Williams College gives it the name Papaquantaquash. The King Philip Rock is a gl large glacial erratic located in southwestern Winchenden along the banks of the Millers River, uh, just north of the confluence of the Millers and Otter Rivers. We'll get to that in a minute. An erratic is a rock deposited by the Wisconsin Glacier 13,000 to 20,000 years ago. Rocks vary in size from hundreds of feet long to just two feet long. They're mostly gray in color due to the freezing and thawing throughout the seasons. Many are adorned by moss, rock tripe, and lichens. Here we have a closer view of the King Philip Rock. It's named for Meta Comet, whom the colonists call King Philip. Arrowheads and other artifacts have been found at the site at the base of the rock. The Indian Meadows sign on the Athol History Trail on South Main Street indicates that Pequog Indians of the Nipmuc tribe built wigwams and planted cornfields alongside the river meadow. Indian relics were found in a field close by until a generation ago, which is probably a couple generations ago now as the signs went up in 1976. This uh, drawing here is from the Athol history booklet. <clears throat> um, you all recognize where that picture's from, the Harvard Forest dioramas, which I can't picture a better drawing or model or anything as to the early European settlement in the area, they're clearing land building stone walls with some of the glacial till found nearby and trying to start some subsistence agriculture. Legend has it that the name Miller was given to the river by the earlier European settlers when a man by that name was drowned while attempting to cross the river on his way to Northfield. I'm not sure what town that occurred in. Um, I just found that in Lord's History of Athol. The European Settlers farm near the river. Uh, the soil there was often more workable than the hills. Villages were eventually built along the river's edge. In this postcard of an unnamed area along the Mills River, we can see some early haying activity here. The industrial development along the Mills River. Early industrial development in the area was largely along waterways especially the Millers River in our area to take advantage of water power. This is another photo from that uh, 1999 reprint of Athol Illustrated that we used before. 
This is uh, Crescent Street here. This is the former Van Valkenburg cotton mill and Sterrett's factory is there today. I believe the only building that survives today is this little building here, which is painted red and it's the Sterrett Museum, which thanks to Joel Shaughnessy, I got in recently. It's very interesting. Yep, it was not built by Sterrett's. It was used by the, the Gary firm, which eventually moved uptown across from where Dennis's uh, inspection station is. That factory was taken down a few years ago. Scene looks different today. We'll get some more pictures of that a little later. Many water powered industries were located along Athol's Mill Brook in the 19th and into the 20th centuries. The Mill Brook is one of many important tributaries which flow into the Miller's River. The Mill River originates near Reservoir Number no. Two in Phillipston, flows through Lake Ellis, then along Main Chestnut and Hapgood Streets into the now empty Lord Pond before joining the Miller's River near the former Athol Lacquer Company building. Uh, the, the reservoirs along this brook were constructed to uh, guarantee a steady flow of water to the mills during periods of drought. So there were many mills along the mill brook that depended on this water power for the manufacture of goods. So they needed to have reservoirs to back the water up in times of floods and rains and then release the water when they needed it. Millbrook water power is recycled many times on its journey down to the Millers River by one industry after another. This is the old Raymond Sash and Blind Complex, uh, the outlet from Lake Ellis, which looked like this in 1970, looking down uh, Lake Ellis Drive here, looking north, this is the bridge over the Mill Brook. Today's uh, senior housing Gibson Drive would be over behind that building. I spent more hours than I should have my freshman year at Athol High School, looking out the window on the west side of the building as they knocked this thing down. The Lee Shoe Manufactory stood on the shore of Lord Pond, which is today the parking lot for Ocean State Job Lot. The arrival of the Massachusetts Railroad in 1847 spurred industrial development along the Millers River by offering reliable transportation of manufactured goods. This is the era the named locomotives rather than numbered them. This particular engine has the named Templeton painted on the side of it. The original route of the Vermont Massachusetts Railroad joined to have the Millers River near its confluence with the Otter River. There's the confluence there. The railroad comes alongside here, which is not far from King Philip Rock, which uh, right around in that area. I drank too much coffee this morning. The point is bouncing around. Stone abutments are all that remain of the railroad's first of several crossings of the Millers River. I hiked in there a few years back and I see what it looked like. The abutments are still there. The northerly route through this area near the village of New Boston was abandoned when a newer railroad alignment was completed in 1882 after an increase in rail traffic following the completion of the building of Hoosick Tunnel in 1875. Today, this 1847 rail road cut is a beautiful hiking trail quite close to the Millers River. Uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers leases its land to the Department of Conservation and Recreation. It's a beautiful hike in there. So where is this? This is on the New Boston Birch Hill area. This is the southwestern corner of Winchenden. When you said New Boston, I was thinking of Oh, yeah. The village of New Boston was part of uh, Winchenden, and it was the houses, and there was a Baptist church there. They were removed in the early 1940s when the Birchill Dam was built. And all that remains there now of human activity is the cemetery, which is there. So you can access it from the road into Lake Denison. It's not far from Baldwinville. This old grade runs alongside the Millers River, just east of the village of Royalston. The Mason and Parker Manufacturing Company was once a large business in South Royalston. You can see the Millers River coming down here under the bridge on King Street in the, throughout the middle of this uh, mill complex. The railroad's here. This smokestack stood until the late 1980s. I have a photo I took of it. And 
Route 68 is over here. The recently closed Royalston Country Store is there. This little building right here, anybody know what that is? Until a few summers ago, that was Pete and Henry's restaurant. Um, the owner of the restaurant told me it was part of the original mill complex there and made into a restaurant in the mid 20th century. The railroad closely follows the course of the Millers River as far west as Millers Falls. You can barely see some of the water in here. Uh, it was a much easier route to construct a railroad through than over the many hills in the area. And we can sort of see the river again here. There were seven, four river crossings of the Millers River between South Wales and Athol. This was the cover bridge known as the Long Bridge. It was the fourth uh, bridge west from South Royalston. And it was wrecked on June 16, 1870, when a train struck a hand car inside the bridge and then collapsed through the floor of the bridge. And there were four, four people, I think, killed and another 20 or so seriously injured and the injured were brought to the basement of the Methodist Church, was at that time was at the corner of uh, Main and Crescent Streets, where Sterrett's parking lot is today. Uh, this is where the location of the Long Bridge was, and the railroad filled in and changed the course of the river after that wreck. And you can see the river today is up here, and it eliminated bridge crossing here known as the short bridge and one on the left which is the long bridge and that resulted in what's called today the duck pond it's a man-made oxbow has a lot of pond lilies in it geese ducks uh great blue herons belted kingfishers and i think the athol conservation commission has a cabin near there is that right yeah. dave and they recently did some logging up there clear cut it and i think i read somewhere indigo buntings prairie warblers and some other yeah, species have been seen well, well, well. yeah all right as we approach athol the first mill is uh, was called the amston or kennebunk mill and this is a bridge over the railroad here that's the uh, north end of kennebunk street this was abandoned many years ago you can see the river alongside here and I understand that uh, doors were manufactured there. You know if that's right, Kent? Yeah, it's probably still some in this town that were made there. Sash, yeah. Long gone now, but you can see the abutments of that bridge. This is. And it's still a piece of the canal. Really? I haven't been in there since 1984. I should go up there again sometime. The. Uh, Sweeping curve on the railroad coming into Athol is known as Kennebunk Curve, uh, not Kennebec, that's an incorrect was Kennebunk. And that was named by a fellow who worked in the mill there who was from Kennebunk, Maine. And for some reason, he called the area Kennebunk, and that's how the name stuck. We turn the other direction, we look down river toward Athol. These would be the buildings along Main Street as you come down the hill by the National Grid plant. Today's UTD will be here. The remaining buildings of the Athol Manufacturing Company are here, and they're right in between the railroad and the Millers River, which comes down here, and the dam was there. This was taken from the railroad bridge in 1970. It's all quite grown in now. I think the only building is remaining is this thing here with the gatehouse with a canal. Uh, aerial view in 1950 showing the uh, Athol Manufacturing Complex when it was active and the Union Twist Drill. I think they had recently added on to it around 1948 or so. And the Mills River comes down here, the Athol Manufacturing Company Dam under Chestnut Hill Avenue over the UTD Bridge. And this is Crescent Street up here. And you can start seeing how the water is ponding up here behind Sterrett's Dam. This would be Main Street. Uh, Tyler Sash and Blind Company was here, was later torn down, and uh, UTD's parking lot is there. Today is the Cannabis Center. Looking over towards Sterrett Dam, and this is where the Van Valkenburg Cotton Factory used to be that I showed you in an earlier view. The Millers River flows beneath Sterrett's complex just west of the dam. You can see the 
uh, dam here, here on Crescent Street Bridge would be right there. Uh, this little picture is a little bit dated. It was taken in 1970, but I wanted to mention that Millows River used to break into three different channels at Starrett's Dam. Uh, today, the water pretty much flows all through the branch north of Marble Street. But one time, a channel crossed Main Street just west of the YMCA, and so it went down where the access road is to the uh, municipal parking lot. That's been gone for many years. Is that related to uh, Canal Street? Not sure, but it could be. I'd like to, Kent, do you know the answer to that? One Canal Street is Canal Street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, at one point, Penn Stock and Watergates were installed in Main Street and it's pushing the flow of water away from that area. Here we're looking uh, east on Main Street. That's the old Methodist Church Memorial Building was built here, and then the Athol Public Library. Temple Manor is over on the right. Sorry, I'm not sure what I'm looking at in that last. Yeah, where, okay, where we're standing gate? about where Island Street is. Where is the gate? Or the gate? Right here. Uh, what are you doing? Yeah. Is that it's pushing the water? Yeah, see here is, I believe that was what was used to lower the uh, the, the floodgates here. Oh. I'm not sure how exactly that worked underground here, but the okay. water went under here and apparently they lowered things from here, which stuck out onto the sidewalk. Where you park in front of Cornerstone Insurance today. It's the only picture I'd be able to come up with that. It's from Lord's History of Athol from 1908. I think they tried some of the road there that carried the water from by the library mm -hmm. and across by the wire call underground. Yeah. I think yeah. the pipes are still there. The pipes are because we did the library, they actually had to research that. They didn't want to fill the library and the pipes. This is uh, Island Street. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the middle branch of the uh, Millows River. Athol Dental will be just to the right of that. This is the old Bates Brothers wallet shop, which was uh, owned by the Bachelor family until the 1990s when it was torn down. Uh, Sterrett Memorial Methodist Church would be to the left. Uh, Athol House of Pizza would be over here. And there's parking spaces along here for the uh, area there. And uh, see, Cornerstone Insurance would be just to the right here. But no sign of that bridge today. You wouldn't know it was the same place. Going over to Orange, we see a wooden trestle which crosses the Millows River near the tapioca factory, an old postcard scene. And in West Orange, the railroad changed the course of the river again. You can see it used to come up like here, and two railroad bridges, which were eliminated, and the railroad dug a new channel for the Millers River here. And today, that's another oxbow similar to Duck Pond. You can see all the stagnant water and pond lilies. That's a much different habitat than the flowing river. This is taken from Route 2A, and the railroad will be hidden in the brush over here. And we can see it again on the topographic map, Route 2A, route, it was Route 2 at the time of the map, Mills River, the railroad, and this uh, oxbow. Also of note, we can take a look over here to the right. We see some of these depressions with hatch marks, which are glacial kettles. One has water in it, and there's several that are dry. As built, the Vermont Massachusetts Railroad followed the easier to build the long topography of the Millows River as far west as what was called Grout's Corner, which today is the Millows River. This is the bridge of the, was the Central Vermont Railroad and is now New England Central. And it's the last railroad crossing of the Millows River on its way west. Millows Falls Tool Company was later the renovated supply company, it was alongside the river. We can see quite a bit of erosion here next to their parking lot. Events along the river. In February of 1900, after a period of warm rain, the river broke up and cakes of ice tore out the center pier of the Northerly Exchange Street Bridge. Photo courtesy Kent Hager, thank you. Didn't have that one before. And I believe you said your grandparents lived there? Yeah, they're on the left. Yeah, this one here. 
another view of it. And the bridge to replace that, was that the current bridge that's there? No. Or is there another one? Well, they wanted to. And then they decided, well, the abutment is kind of a as of the rising water, the ice. Yeah. So they, they put a uh, bridge, concrete uh, bridge with no abutment. Okay. All right. This view will be saw we're looking toward the river from today's laundromat car wash and Peak Bog Ave will be here, Wallingford Ave up on the hill. Flood water and chunks of ice backed up to Sutherland's greenhouses on South Main Street in Athol. Uh, that's near where Butler's Paints was until a few months ago. I think some of these houses still there across the street from the North Quabbin family physicians. Over in Orange, Similar flooding, the bridge on the South Main Street, or rather uh, up to the capacity there. People going around in boats to get where they needed to go. Trains on the Fitchburg Railroad were slowed by the water, but they didn't stop altogether. Today's diesel locomotives, you couldn't run that through water, you get short circuiting, but the steam locomotives were able to negotiate that a little deeper. However, when I got to station stops, either people's feet got wet or these gentlemen probably paid extra to be given a ride on this baggage wagon to drag around. The uh, courthouse building is behind here. In 19, March of 1936, warm weather and heavy rains caused a huge flood on the Millows River. One corner of the L.S. Sterrett Company was carried away. And that's where the Van Valkenburg cotton mill used to be. Uh, my neighbor's father was a machinist and he crawled out on the girders to retrieve his tools. He didn't want to fall into the abyss. He was rather brave. Today, if you look at Sterrett's, you can see these different colored bricks on that corner. They were did a great job rebuilding it to look like the rest of the building, but the bricks are lighter in color. The river really swelled west of Sterrett's. So you can see this Methodist church here. This would be Marble Street, the parking lot for the town hall and libraries in this area. Now that's right outside this building. We're sitting right here. Those are the windows for this building. That's the corner right out here on Canal and Main Street. Spectators watching the water rise. That is so weird, all the people. <laughs> Was this an early ABNC meeting with Dave? Or... <laughs> yeah. But it was the hurricane of September 1938, which caused the most damage along the course of the Millers River. Hames Studio published this great booklet after the flood, and we'll take a look at some of the pictures. They may not have seen them before. If you see flood pictures in the Athol Orange area, Look at the trees. If you don't see leaves on, it's probably the March 36 flood. Whereas if you see leaves on trees, it's the hurricane of 38. At that time, we didn't have the uh, re weather reports that are so instantaneous. Um, back uh, a few weeks ago, I got the cell phone and I started buzzing that there was a tornado watch. And uh, instantaneous, those days you didn't have that weather reporting. My mother who grew up west of Boston she and her friends were out in the yard pretending it was a hurricane. Finally, my grandmother came out and said, you better come in. I think it really is a hurricane. Yes, it was. So anyway, let's have a look at that flood. Here we see Sterrett's Dam and Crescent Street, or more aptly named it a river at that point. And it was just gushing through there. Looking down Crescent Street, Sterrett's Boiler House is here. Looking north on Crescent Street, just look at the water flowing over there. Caused a lot of damage. And I took this picture a couple of weeks ago up at Sterrett's Boiler House. They nicely marked the high water of the 36 and 38 floods. So if you're not familiar with that, take a look at it sometime. Yes, it was. Yep. I mean, I see all the postcards are 36. Yeah, 36, but 38 caused more damage and higher water. Here's a, a postcard looking down Main Street, about in front of Cornerstone Insurance. 
Uh, this thing that says Elmo's Restaurant is the Athol House of Pizza, minus the upper stories. The stair building, Athol Credit Union's over here, Pequog Hotel, and there was several feet of water on Main Street. Uh, my neighbor told me that he remembered it going up and down Main Street in a boat. Looking in the other direction, this is from the flood booklet picture. This is almost in front of the York Theater. And we can see again where House of Pizza is, Starrett's Boiler House Chimney, the library and town hall are up here, but it's all water here as far as Island Street. Looking from a little bit west of the post office, down this way towards St. Francis Church, uh, Higgins Funeral Homes here. The building we we're in, which at that time was the Main Street School, is somewhat hidden behind these trees, but you can see the water is back way up onto Main Street. Numerous trees have fallen down, been blown down by the hurricane, which are in the process of being cut up here. That would be looking out this window toward the business across the street. The bridge would be over here. And uh, yeah, it was underwater. Canal Street stop sign would be right about here today. Fish Park, which is out the back window here, didn't uh, fare too much better. It seems to be almost completely flooded. The Gage Road covered bridge it survived the 36th flood, but not the 38th flood. And here it is washed up against the new bridge on Daniel Shays Highway. McDonald's be up here, Gethsemane Cemetery. This is looking north. Much of downtown Orange was inundated by the flood. Uh, this is the center of Orange Castle Rock Pizzas here, the old Tepper's store there. Um, looking over toward East and West River Street. I don't know where your house is, Keith, somewhere off in there. But the rescue boat on Bacon Street in Orange at 1.30 in the morning. I don't think it was too deep here because the people waiting in boots don't seem to be up to their hips, but they're nevertheless rescuing some folks. Over at the tapioca plant, the water came all the way up across what was then Route 2, now 2A. Boston Main Railroad suffered severe damage at Wendell Depot. The uh, bridge is here, which has collapsed, and the river just tore out the embankment here. Things were not much better at Irving Paper Mills. This is looking east. Uh, I got a little confused the angle of this photo by the covered bridge, but I looked on old topo map. There was indeed a uh, crossing, a road crossing there at one time, which connected it to a road to Wendell. Damage to Route 2 and the railroad at Farley Flats. This is, was and is Route 2 here. The very high Millows River, which is somewhat receding at that point. The railroad had to rebuild Harris Bridge. This is a view taken in 1985 with the river going under it. And the sign alongside Route 2 commemorates where water was five and a half feet above the highway at the worst of the flooding, September 38. The U.S. Corps of Army Engineers built flood control dams on the east branch of the Tully River in Royalston and on the Millers River at Birch Hill in South Royalston in response to the huge floods and the thousands and thousands of dollars of damage in 36 and 38. Birch Hill Dam was completed 1941, thereabouts. Uh, we can look off the access road across the dam. Little Formation Rock is here. Paul Kaczynski said he found a core drill plug in the area of the amphibolite. Didn't know what depth it was from. We're looking east, we saw a discolored mark here. That's the original root of the river. The river today goes down a channel to the gatehouse, this mm -hmm. way, but that's the original root of the river and look in the other whoops sorry the other direction down river there's sort of some stagnant water which is the original channel and today's channel comes over here um found this online and then crawl down there to get my own picture but a good look at the man-made channel where the river goes today and the building of the Birch Hill Dam brought about the third alignment of the railroad through the area. The first one, which I mentioned before, built in 1847, which you can hike on, lob it today, drive on some, was abandoned in 1882. King Philip Rock is up here. The newer alignment was built in 1882, 
And that had to be shifted again in 1941 for construction of the Birchfield Dam because some of that was going to be underwater when water was held back. The uh, Golden Spike was driven on the new rail line July 22nd, 1941, and the first train came through this big cut here. Uh, the new line here was 35 feet higher and some uh, feet south of the, its predecessor. I think some of this that, uh, that was quarried out of here was used to fill both here and perhaps alongside the dam, I'm not sure. As the 20th century war on pollution of the Millers River increased to an alarming level, industrial discharge, municipal and residential sewage were chief sources of the pollution. Farmers began to fence the river to prevent their livestock from drinking from the waste-laden water. By 1965, Massachusetts Fish and Game had stopped stocking the river with trout west of the Otter River. After the first Earth Day on April 22, 1970, America became increasingly aware of environmental concerns and how a polluted environment threatens human health. Uh, I've got a series of images my father took in April 70 leading up to the Earth Day along the Millers River Millbrook. I just selected a handful out of the many he took. This shows the discolored water flowing over the Athol Manufacturing Company Dam. Eighth grade students peer into the canal outside the Athol Manufacturing Company buildings. You can see this slick of oil on top of the water, which didn't look too good. Looking down river, we can see again the discoloration. A lot of that at this point is from the paper mills upstream. From the end of Silver Lake Street, you can see where the town used to dump snow and whatever was included in the snow into the river here. That's this pile here. UTD, Athol Manufacturing Company Dam. Uh, the UTD Dam, it's a little bit of trivia told to me by one of my friends who was one of the executives of UTD. That's probably the only dam in the United States which is reinforced with high strength steel. Uh, high strength steel is used in making drills and so forth at UTD. And they were building the dam and they had been told that there was some rod stock they could use inside for reinforcing the dam. They went in and some know nothing and they said it must be this stuff, which was a new shipment of high speed steel. And by the time Anyone found out about the concrete was setting up. So, Mill Brook, an important tributary of the Mills River, was in terrible condition. It was used for dumping and everything. This is the old Athol foundry between Riverbend and Fletcher Streets. In 1970, it burned recently, and all sorts of junk. You name it, it was just thrown into the Mill Brook. And there's a spring right nearby, which I wouldn't be willing to drink out at that point. Were people using it at that point? Yeah, they were. The polluted water from Mill Brook emptied into the already polluted water of the Millers River near the Athol Lacquer Company. This picture would be taken from Morton Meadows across the river. Little by little, through the Clean Water Act and other legislation, actions by responsible citizens and organizations, the Millers River has largely been cleaned up. Discharge of untreated waste directly into the river has ceased, and stocking of the river with fish started again in 1983. The river rat race, nice photo by Alan Young, and uh, this is probably taken over near the lacquer company. And I believe the name of the race was originally to, given in the early 60s to draw attention to how polluted the river was. I remember when I was young, my father cautioned me to never touch or step foot in the Millers River for fear I might dissolve. I'm not sure if I would have, but it wasn't very good looking then. Besides canoe racing, sections of the river are used for whitewater kayaking. Today, much of the land on either side of the Millers River, east of Athol, are protected wildlife, wildlife management and conservation areas and provide scenic beauty to all. Cooperative efforts to stock fish so the remote Bears Den section of the Mills River has been continued by Mass Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Trout Unlimited, and Guilford Rail Systems. Mass Division of Fishers and Wildlife map shows a 6.5 mile catch and release area through Bears Den. 
catchable size rainbow brook and brown trout are stocked every spring and rainbows are stocked again in the fall months. The wildlife and beauty of nature surround the Mills River for those with a keen eye and perhaps a camera. A few years back, I was down on Indian Meadow waiting to photograph a special train that was coming through this beautiful white-tailed deer ran across in front of me. And then my train came and then all was silent. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Have any questions? You uh, mentioned the Clean Water Act and the cleanup that took place certainly impressive. What I wonder is, were there sites that were left behind that had to be addressed by the uh, EPA's super fund? I wouldn't be surprised. Dave, do you know the answer to that? Well, what's the question? <laughs> if there were super fund sites along the Mills River that would be cleaned up by the EPA and others that were I don't others. think we ever got any super fund sites. I don't remember hearing any. You know, because a lot of it happened before they put those super fund sites in, in yeah. play. You know, they were earlier. I don't know who cleaned up the mill brook, but it doesn't look like that that day with boards and hot.